Good morning. And what a wonderful day this is. This is the day the Lord has made. And I invite you to rejoice in this day with me. Technology is a wonderful thing, isn't it? For those of you who are in the sanctuary, you know that I'm not there. I'm at home being quarantined because of having to be uh, quarantined for my the next um, the left eye being operated on on Tuesday, uh, Wednesday. And so I thank Steve and, and I thank Kim and um, Dwayne for putting this together so that I could speak while you are there and we can share in this service of worship and celebration together. It is a delight to welcome you. Those of you who are in other places, we welcome you. Those who are at home, we trust that the Spirit of God will, will truly work so that we will connect together in doing what we are gathering together to do, and that is to worship and to celebrate the Lord our God. Please allow me these few announcements. Um, I begin with the discipleship class tonight at 6 o'clock. Please do not forget that, members of that class. There will be no meeting on Wednesday. Our midweek meeting will be um, laid aside for Thursday, which is our Christmas Eve service. And that service will begin at 7 o'clock in the evening. Christmas Eve service, we're looking forward to it, and we trust that you will share um, that service with us. If there's anything, I don't think there needs to be any adjustment. You do it just that you would normally um, get a Sunday morning or a Wednesday evening. Also, I would like to um, suggest that next Sunday, Lord's willing, the 27th, we will meet at the usual time. And I am hoping that by that time, I am able to, even though I will not probably be driving, uh, Lois will be driving me and I'll be, will be able to get together for the last Sunday of the year, so, so to speak. Uh, also, I'm, I'm reminding you of the um, uh, graveside service for Paul's mother uh, tomorrow. And we also are grieving with um, Heidi and Wayne, the passing of um, Wayne's mother, that Heidi Ball. So please remember those um, in prayer today. And then um, I am I'm thinking if there, the office will be closed uh, during the Christmas week after this Wednesday until next Monday. But if there are any concerns, please be sure to um, reach me by phone. Uh, Paul, um, not Paul, Paul is still quarantined, but uh, um, you will be able to reach um, John or Warren or Connie if that is needed. So thank you so very much for being a part of our time together. Now, my, my wife was hoping to be there today, um, but she's not able to come. Um, um, she, she's not sick, but she does have some, some problems with her leg that would make it a little bit difficult to drive in, in the rain. And so that is why she's not here uh, today. Uh, she's standing this me. I'm sure she's itching to say something. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Have a wonderful week. We'll see you next weekend. Okay. And so we want to make the transition now into our time of worship. And I'm going to call on Sean, one of our singers, to invite you to stand and to listen to the call to worship and then remain standing for our songs of this season. Would you please stand? As I was reading through the call to worship today, it's uh, Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. I thought to myself, I could probably just do this by memory, but <laughs> my memory's not quite as good as a pastor's, <laughs> so I actually will put my glasses on and read it. <laughs> Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness. 
From that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Would you join us as we sing, O Come All Ye Faithful.
Thank you. Be, be seated, I trust. Well, what can we ever do without sensing the need to seek the face of God? And that's what we're going to be doing now as we pray for our church, for our world, and pray that God will be pleased to pour his blessing upon us and relieve us of the, the fear that we have because of this present pandemic. So I invite you now to join me in prayer. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, we bow before you this morning, Lord, some with happy hearts, some with sad hearts, some with doubtful hearts. And Lord, I pray that as we come to you, you will relieve us of all the concerns that would block out our enjoyment of who you are. You are God. And again, we are reminded that those in heaven never, never get tired of giving praise and adoration and glory to God. They see by sight what we are simply able to see by faith. But Lord, we pray that their joy will be our joy because the object of, of our adoration is the same. I pray that you will grant to us a deep sense of understanding the one that called us to himself. That is what your word teaches. That when we were dead in trespasses and sins, you quickened us and made us alive with Christ. That we might see, might see the grace that was lavished on us in our salvation. And Father, today, when the world is in turmoil, we are wanting for a moment to go back to that night in Bethlehem. We want to remember the mystery of mysteries. When you sent your son into the world through the womb of a mother, of a woman, Give us a sense of the wonder of this, I pray. Help us to understand that we are not dealing with things that earth can do. In fact, so difficult it is that some on earth do not believe this message. But it is so. Ask the shepherds. Ask the wise men. And Father, I pray that once again, our hearts will truly flow with the wonder of the message and the babe of what we call Christmas. We know that our Lord was not born on December 25. We know that he might not have been born in the month of December. It is simply the month that we take to remember that at a time in space and time, God broke into our darkness with the light of his son and he brought us his salvation. And for that, we give you our grateful thanks this morning. Father, we thank you that you have come not only to bring us salvation, but to comfort us. And we, Lord, as a congregation this morning, lift to you Paul and Lori and Paul's family as they will lay to rest tomorrow morning, Paul's mother. Thank you that they have the blessed assurance that Father, when she expired last week, she left the body here, but her spirit soared to God. We do pray and give you thanks that Paul and his family Lori and Holly 
and each member of the family celebrate the home going of a mother. And Father, we do pray for Heidi and Wayne. We thank you, Father, to my knowledge that she too is rejoicing having left this world, called by you into your presence. And we pray, Father, for Heidi and for Wayne. We pray, Father, for the members of the family, for Josh and for Donovan, and for other members of the family. We ask that you will be pleased to draw near to them this morning. Grant them, Father, the peace that passes understanding. Let them hear your words, Lord, that whoever lives and believes in you never dies. They simply make a transition. And so we thank you that in the midst of death, we know life. We thank you for your protection of God's family during this time of pandemic. Although, Lord, the disease has come close to us, we thank you that it has not been among us. We thank you for protecting Paul. Thank you for keeping Gwen away from it. We took the precautions, Lord, because we wanted to be wise, not because we fear, but because in wisdom we felt it was the best thing to do. And these two people willingly separated themselves until they passed through the period that would free them. And so we thank you for that. But we pray, Father, that in your providence you will care for those who are laid aside because of illness. We think again of Russ and Donna. We think of Doris and Dorothy and we think of Robert. We think of Martha. Father, these that we are sure that if it were in their capacity to be with us this morning gathered, they would be here. They would be there. And so we pray that you will draw near to them, comfort them this morning. May they hear the voice, do not fear, for I am with you. We pray for wisdom and guidance for the leaders of the country and those who are issuing vaccine for this, for COVID-19. Give us wisdom to know how to respond to this. And Father, we pray that, Lord, if this should be the answer to it, that it will be recognized that God gave the wisdom to do it. But we pray that no underhanded thing may have been done to bring about this vaccine, but only that which was wise and done with diligence and with honesty. We do pray, Father, that you will be with those who are, uh, we call them first responders. We pray again for our policemen and firemen. We thank you for those who are keeping the gates in other parts of the world so that the enemy will not get near. But, oh, God, help us not to put our trust in princes, but in God. Please remember again, Father, our missionaries. We thank you for them. We pray for those who might be traveling little distance to be with loved ones. Grant them protection. Grant them guidance. We pray for ministries that is taking place right now across Lebanon and Albany. We pray that where the, the word of God and the carols are sounding forth this morning, that the very angel of heaven will be affected by it. And Father, thank you for those who have laid aside their offerings that they will deliver in the offering boxes at the end of this service. May their hearts be filled with wonder and gratitude for all your provisions. Thank you again and ask your blessing upon the continued progress of this service. In Jesus' name, amen. Glorious night, see the dawn of salvation. 
creation. Angels in white fill the skies with their wondrous song. Awakening earth with news of his birth. Join the of the highest heaven. Long as the world fought the song of the angels. Son of Adam, son of Lamb, given us. 
Thank you so very much. I trust that these songs prepared your heart to listen to God's word that is found this morning in the book of Zephaniah. I invite you to turn to the book of Zephaniah. Um, if you don't know where that Zephaniah is, you go to the book of Matthew, the first chapter, and turn back three books and you'll get to Zephaniah. Not very many people would look for a Christmas message from Zephaniah, but I just filled, I just found my heart filled with great joy of the Christmas story found in verse 17, although I'll read from verse 14, verse 15. Verse 15, but the text is really verse 17. This is the word of God. The Lord has taken away his judgment against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You will fear disaster no more. In that day it will be said to Jerusalem, Do not be afraid, O Zion. Do not let your hands fall limp. The Lord your God is in your midst, a victorious warrior. He will exult over you with joy. He will be quiet in his love. He will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. The word of God. Pray once more with me, please. Our Father, please grant that your spirit will open our understanding as he teaches us from your word this morning. As your voice to the people of God, he must be in control of me that I will not project into the text what is not there, nor say what I think others would want to hear, but precisely and uniquely what God is saying through this text to us this morning. So I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation in our hearts will be acceptable to you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The book of Zephaniah, is not known for giving a message about Christmas, as it is known for messages dealing with the restoration of Israel in a day to come. However, as I looked at this text for the morning, I find that it centers, it centers upon, uh, on, on God. And I want you to keep that in mind as you look to the text. Most of the books deal, deal with the coming judgment. But when we look at verse 15 and verse 17, Zephaniah says something that very few of the other texts tells us about God. Very, even, even Isaiah, Jeremiah, wonderful as those books are, they do not give us something about God as we shall see uh, this morning. I happen to be listening to a well-known Christian celebrity yesterday, uh, Friday, I'm sorry, Friday. Beautiful musician, wonderful um, person. And, and he began, it was a Christmas celebration for 2020, this year. So it's quite relevant. And the first three uh, songs that he sang had to do with Christmas on earth and snow and the rest of it. And then he, he went through, and I think there were two songs, 
two songs that he shared dealing with Christmas. In fact, this is how he ended his whole presentation. This was his last song, and he said this is one of his favorites, and I, I could not believe it. But listen to what he says. Oh, the happiest Christmas is a homecoming Christmas with snow fluttering down till the world looks new. Bright candles burning, old friends returning, the wishes of children come true. And the happiest wishes are just old fashioned wishes. May your day be merry, your sorrow be small. May, may the ones you love be near you. That is the happiest Christmas of all. Dear friends, as I listen to that, I literally grieve. I almost wept that someone with that capacity as this individual has could have a Christmas celebration ending with a song he said is his, the, the favorite of his that does not even mention Christ. And I want you to see something in this text this morning that I trust will thrill your hearts as it did mine as I studied it. Zephaniah is talking about God. But in his conversation about God, you can see the Christmas story emerging as you go along. Consider with me what I call the magnificent gift. The magnificent gift. Why is this gift so magnificent? Magnificent. Listen to what he says. The Lord, the Lord God is, is, not will be, not was, but the Lord God is in your midst. The Lord God is in your midst. Let's identify this God that we're talking about. We are told in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, the baby to be born of you shall be called Emmanuel, which being interpreted means God with us. God is in your midst. Consider again Isaiah 9, 6. Who is this baby in that manger? Who is this God that is in the midst of us? A, a, a baby in a, in a crib, in a manger, in a stall, with animals around him? That is a magnificent gift. Listen. In that cradle, in that manger, is the one whose name is Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. Keep that in mind. Mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Peace. This is the last Sunday of Advent. And what is promised to us in that babe is what is given to us because that's what we need most. We need someone who has the power to transform, to change, to bring new things out of old things that's destroying us. The Lord God is with us. He is in our midst. The baby Mary carried was son of the highest, the son of God. The baby that Simeon held was the God of creation. Uh, let, let, let me suggest something to you. Emmanuel, we sing it. But do we have the sense that in that word, we are told something that no other religion can ever boast, that the God we worship is the God who is among us. That's Christmas, friends. That's Christmas. This is why this gift is so magnificent. Because in, in what we call the incarnation, God 
comes near to us, we don't try to reach God. What a magnificent gift. But we do not only have a magnificent gift. We have what I call an indomitable gift. This, this gift has no equal. Look at the second part of that verse. The Lord God is among us, Emmanuel. And look at what it says. He is, in the King James says, he is mighty. He is mighty. If you have the NASB, it says that he is a victorious warrior. That is inherent in that word. So this gift does not come to remain a child. This gift comes into the world to grow up, to, to confront the source of evil, the enemy of God, and the enemy of man's soul. His name shall be called Jesus, the one who saves. His name shall be called Salvation, the one who saves. He comes to save. Even our Christmas carol says it. He comes to save. We celebrate today not simply a baby in a manger, but we are celebrating the fact that the one who grew up out of the, 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 the Bethlehem and walked the streets of Jerusalem died one day on the cross, but before he died, he confronted evil in its, in its rawness. That's what the word Jesus means. He did not come at first to be admired. He came to die. Admiration will come later on. He comes now to save. That's why he is a mighty warrior. For you and me to know the joy of Christmas, Jesus did not only have to come, he had to overcome the one who actually robbed us of our relationship with God. He comes to save. The battle began in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between her seed and your seed. And then the text says this, he shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. Jesus Christ confronted Satan ultimately on the cross and he gave Satan the death blow. He is still walking around. He's still sending out his, his mission, his demons. But my friends, they know that they are on a death row. The time has come, the time is coming when they will no longer be able to interfere with the people of God because Jesus gave a decisive blow to Satan on the cross. He bruised his head. He has no way to recover from that. He came to save. You see that word save has these meanings. To save means to deliver, to deliver. He delivers us from Satan's power when he came. To save means to defend. He is our defense against all evil. To save means to preserve. So that Jesus later on could say, that when we come to him, no one shall be able to pluck us out of his hands. We are our, our life as believers, says Colossians chapter 3. We are, we are hidden with Christ in God. And Jesus has already won the victory. He came, as the song says, to save us from Satan's power. He is the victorious warrior. That is why I was saddened that my friend could not end with a better song than the happiest day of Christmas. Because nothing in that song promised victory. Nothing in that song promised delivery. It had to do with just you and me. And when we go to, back to different places, we go back to our chief concern. But oh, 
when we see who was in that manger, that in that manger was a victorious warrior. Jesus came not to curse, but to die. But his death was to deliver us from the curse. And that's why it is an indomitable gift. It's a gift that has no compassion, a gift that cannot be overcome, a gift that, that cannot be destroyed. We are, we are protected, divinely protected. And when, when we leave this world, when he left this world, the scripture says, he passed through the powers of the air. He went right through, right to glory, right to the right hand of God, because he is a mighty one, a victorious warrior. That's why we celebrate Christmas. That's why we are moved by the gift that we see in the baby in the manger. But my friends, there is something more. Can there be anything more? If God sent us his only son, he gave us the best of heaven, can there be anything more? Well, I am happy to say that there is. And oh, this is where this text becomes most beautiful as far as Christmas is concerned. I want you to see in verse 17 again, the Lord our God, it says, is in your midst. And he will rejoice over you. In fact, let me read it from the King James translation. I love it. I love it. He will say, he will rejoice over you with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over you with singing. Let me break this down, friends. I, I want you to see something that you will not find any other place about God as such. He will rejoice over you with joy. When that babe became the man Christ Jesus, and he went to the cross, he made the way for you and me to return to the one who created us and who by his great love for us redeemed us by the shedding of his son's blood. Listen, please. And every time a sinner turns to Jesus Christ, a boy or a girl, a man or a woman, rich or poor, whoever he or she may be, every time someone is brought into the kingdom, listen to what Jesus says in Luke chapter 15 and verse 7. There is joy in the presence of the angels. This is what I want you to see. What I, this is why I call it the divine excitement. There are theologians that say that God is complacent. By that, they don't mean that, he, that he's indifferent. But God doesn't need anything, and that is true. But God is not some unfeeling ogre somewhere just ready to pounce on us. No, my friend, when we, when, we, when we trust in the Son of God, Jesus, the babe that was in the, in, in, in the manger who became our Savior, God rejoices. Think of that this morning. As you sit where you are, whether you are in the sanctuary or whether you are at home, if you are a believer in Christ Jesus as Savior, you, if you please, and I say this with excitement and yet with wonder, you made God happy. Think of that for a moment. The, div the one thing that excites God you remember when, when Jonah wouldn't go to Nineveh? And then he finally reluctantly went. I may mention this in a few minutes. God said, should I not care for those 120,000 people who don't know the right hand from their left? God is never satisfied when Satan still controls men and women wherever they are. But when they come to Jesus Christ, God rejoices over them for every believer 
in a way that you and I can never understand. This is what Christmas is all about. It is not so that our children will get toys. It is not so that we exchange toys with one another. It is not so that we are able to, to eat a big meal. And God help us not so that we can watch football or basketball. Let us not go through this Christmas without realizing that God is rejoicing over us. Listen to Charles Spurgeon. I love this. This is, this is a quote from Spurgeon. You are happy when God saves you, but not as happy as God is for saving you. You are glad when you are pardoned, he is more glad. The prodigal son was glad to see his father, but not as glad as his father was to see him. Why? Because the heart of the father was larger than the heart of the prodigal son or his brother. So that, that God provided Christmas. I, I, I don't know how to say this without sounding almost blasphemous, but friends, it is what the text is saying. God providing, provided Christmas so that he might rejoice over us, not simply us rejoicing in him. When Christ was born, there was singing on earth because there was singing in heaven. That's what the King James says. Listen to the last part of where, where you have in your text. He will shout with joy. Literally, he will be singing over you. God will be singing. Imagine that. What voice on earth can be as beautiful as the voice of God? Yet we are told he will rejoice over us with singing. Oh my, thanks be to God for this season. God not only is joyful over us, he sings over us. Here is God who needs nothing, yet there is divine excitement over the redeemed ones. How do you feel this morning? Do you feel lonely? God is singing about you in heaven. Ephesians 1 says that he has an inheritance in us. That's his inheritance. That when, when, please listen. When Satan fell from heaven, God was not affected. When you and I were sold out for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, God is affected. When you and I, so he said, he did something about our lostness by sending his son as a babe to become a man into the world. And by so coming, God was moved with excitement because of the accomplishment of that babe in the manger who became the Christ of the cross. The divine excitement. I, I think of, of those who are sick. I was speaking with Doris Patterson a few days ago and, and she was telling me that they were all in the quarantine. Everything is being done in their room. They can't go out and only the nurse can come in to give the food. And then Doris said to me, I have some friends here, but oh, how good, how good. No, she didn't use the word singing. I'm saying this, how good to know that I am cared for by God. But my friends, it's not only cared for by God. It is God is singing over Doris. God is singing over Dorothy. God is singing over Russ. God is singing over Martha. God is singing over you. Each one of you sitting in this room this morning, each one at home who trusts in Jesus Christ, there is a chorus in heaven right now about God. Not about you. 
It's about God. But you are the cause of it. This God who needs nothing is moved by the redemption of his son. But there's one more thing. If, if, we have, if we have noticed the divine excitement, if we have noticed, my friends, what, what took place in heaven, I want you to look at what I call the mysterious emotion that we see in this verse. It's very mysterious. I have read, I've listened to others and nobody seemingly has been able to come to a, a, a conclusion of the verse. Listen to what it says. Zephaniah 3.17 He will be quiet in his love or he will rest in his love. This whole chapter has been, has been a, a problem for theologians. But what it is that is exciting God what is it? Look, my friends, in verse 15 and verse 14, verse 15, he's removing our guilt from us. You see, the reason God can remove our guilt from us is because that which separated us from God has been cared for. When Christ was on the cross, Isaiah 55, 53 says, it pleased the Lord. And some have looked at that as being vindictive. No, friends. The pleasures of God in his love means this. When it, when it says that God is quiet in his love, listen to what it means. God did not send his son reluctantly. He did not send his son with, I hope they'll appreciate what I'm doing for them. He did not send his son with misgivings. When God saved you and me, when Christ was on the cross for our salvation, God was pleased in his love. There was nothing, nothing else that could be done for the human race but what Jesus did, and God rested in his love. But let me give you an illustration of what that means, friends. It means that there are times... Even for our loved ones, we do things and we have reluctance in doing it. I, I, I tell you the, the, the story of, of my, own, my, own, my own life. When my dear mother would, 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 would give me the strap, I, I had to wait before mom would, would, would give me the sense that everything was okay. See, even though she loved me, but there was some, there was some, you know, was some, negative aspect and we all go through that husbands with wives and wives with husbands children with parents and parents with children we might do things but there is still a bit of agitation in us not so with god the love of god was not threatened by his his giving of his son god did not love us with a kind of love that had reservations and that he loved us Really, listen to, to, to Romans chapter 8. God, who spared not his own son, but gave him up for us all, gave him up. It may be defined, that love may be defined as the perfection of God by which he is eternally moved to self-communicate. It is the perfection of God. He needs nothing. That's why Ephesians says we're saved by grace. We can't earn it. But in responding to what God has done, we, we are the object that, that I, I even hate to use the word stimulate, but makes God excited. Listen to another theologian. I love this. The love of God for sinners is not his making much of them, but his graciously freeing them and empowering them to make much of him. That's why we, we celebrate this day. We're making much of God. Isaiah chapter 62 verse 4 said, You will be called my delight. 
For the Lord delights in you. Isaiah 6, 62, 5. For as a young woman, a young man marries a virgin, so your God will be, will, will rejoice over you. Let, let, let me close with this, friends. Think of it. Individually, God rejoiced over us. Individually, God loves us. But Zephaniah says that a day is coming when this babe who was in a manger, who was incarnated, and who walked the streets of, of, of Jerusalem and was killed by sinful hands, was raised from the dead, is now seated at the right hand of God. A day is coming when we too shall stand in the presence of God. When Paul will see his mother again, and everyone who has died in Christ will see their loved one, and God will gather us from the east and from the west. Guess what? God is going to sing over us. Wow. Can you imagine what that will sound like? God will sing over us. That's what the text says. That's why, my friends, Christmas has to do with us in redemption. But oh, do not leave God out of it because he is celebrating as well. This is why the angels, when they were going back to heaven, said, glory to God in the highest. And in that day, when God removes from us everything that has hindered us from worshiping and celebrating and enjoying him, when we stand in glory, listen, this is what we will say. Who is a God like you who pardons iniquity and passes over the rebellious acts of the remnant of his possession? He restrains his anger forever because he delights in unchanging love. The excitement of God for Christmas Listen, friends, as you go through this week and move to the 25th, exchange your gifts, enjoy your dinner, but please do not enjoy everything by forgetting God. Remember him. And as C.S. Lewis says, we will, we will enjoy the best when we enjoy it to his glory. To you and everyone from God, Merry Christmas from Lois and me. God bless you. Let's pray. Take your word, Father, and drive it home to our hearts that we will see for the first time God's excitement over the coming of his son, over the dying of his son, over the rising of his son, and the gathering of God's people to take place when God will lead the choir in heaven because of his great love with which he has loved us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, would you stand as we sing our final Christmas song, Hark the Herald Angels Sing? I, when I see this title, I think of Paul. And so let's sing a little bit louder for Paul today. <laughs>
join me in the benediction. And I use the words of Simeon when he looked into the face of the Son of God given to him by Mary and Joseph. Now, Lord, thou dost let thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For our eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel forever and ever. Amen. Good day, and again, Merry Christmas.